Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2 Super Mini Mail Call and we're going to get right into it. I hope there's not anything perishable in here because uh, I've had this box for a little bit of time now. I think it's been in the basement for a good number of months. Anyhow, it's 2023 and it is now time to open this up. We have Boxception again, <laughs> a box inside a box. Let's see if I can lift this out. Oh, this is just something covering something else. I don't think there's actually something in this. Yep, there we go. That is just packing material. Oops. Wow, what do we have here? It's big, whatever this is, and it is rectangular. So I don't know what this could be actually. All right, well, uh, there's a lot of layers of packing material here, so I'm just gonna stop talking and un unravel this thing. All right, well, this is interesting. The inside of the packing material is a plywood box. So the mystery deepens here. Alrighty, I put it on a furniture dolly so I can uh, more easily move this around. It's not super heavy actually, but I wonder what's in here. It's kind of the size of a Macintosh, uh, maybe, you know, a small Macintosh. For easy opening, remove the circled screws on the side. And on the side, which I know you can't really see very well, it says Apple II forever. So maybe that's not a Macintosh because it wouldn't say Apple II. There's a circled screw there. And there's a circle screw on this side along with Apple II forever. And there are some straps on here. This is an amazingly elaborate box. And of course, look, fragile. Must be Italian. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna use this drill here to help expedite the removal of the screws here. All right, now this uh, top cover appears to be loosened now. What an amazing packing job. I am blown away. Okay, so right on the top, there is a letter. Like this is strategically done for uh, the proper opening process. Alrighty, this package comes from Jim, and Jim writes, Greetings from my Apple IIc 4100 and ImageWriter 2 printer in Salisbury, North Carolina. I hope this letter and offerings to Digital Basement find you well. It's fragile. I mean, it's obviously great. I love your channel, especially the Apple II and TRS-80 color computer topics. The Apple II Plus was my first computer I was privileged enough to place my hands on in elementary school. And in middle school, the computer labs were loaded with Apple IIe's and I absolutely fell in love with them. Unfortunately, we didn't have the means to afford an Apple, but I was blessed to have received one year for Christmas a TRS-80 color computer too. After that, I upgraded to a Coco 3, and, and by the end, I had every imaginable accessory for the Coco. The first MS-DOS machine I purchased myself was a Tandy 1000 EX, or sorry, HX. So all those machines you've had in the basement are near and dear to my heart. Also like you, they have led to my career in IT. And yes, if you're not familiar with my backstory, the VIC-20 was my first computer that my father bought me. That was in 1982, and he thought that computers were the future and that his son, who seemed to have some aptitude for electronics and stuff, might like a computer. I was seven at the time, and all I had was a data set and some books. So I did a lot of basic while typing in programs and then starting to write my own basic programs on that thing. I loved that VIC-20. I brought that thing everywhere with me. He had made me a little carrying case in a little briefcase with foam cutouts inside so the computer could go in there perfectly with the little power supply and the cables and stuff. And I could bring it to people's houses, like if I was visiting the grandparents, plug it into the TV and compute away. But when I featured the Apple II on my channel that Stuart had sent in, I talked about the fact that my father also bought a computer for the home for people to share, and that was a used Apple II Plus, and I loved that machine as well. My older brother would get games and stuff from it, for I guess from friends, he would copy them or whatever. So I used to play the games on that thing, and it just had an amber screen, but I really liked the high resolution text and the really good feeling keyboard. We also had a 300 baud modem for that thing, so I basically BBSed and stuff as well. And I love that thing. So my father, a few years later, got me an Apple IIc of my own because me and my brother used to fight like crazy about using the Apple II Plus. And my brother tells me that he got a Commodore 64 because all he ever wanted to do was game. I remember vaguely he had a Commodore 64 and a 1541, but by that point I was an Apple person and I don't think I touched my VIC-20 again. 
not for like 20 years until 20 years later. Anyways, it goes on from there. You know, I had a 2GS and a bunch more computers. I never had a 64. I never had any Coco machines. I only experienced the Tandy 1000 line through a friend of mine. My best friend had a Tandy 1000. I think it was an SX, the desktop, and we used to play Sierra games on that thing. But I have fond memories of so many computers, like the TI friend had one of those. I had a friend with a C128, stuff like that. So of course, I always wanted to get those machines. And you know, now in the basement, I've had tons of machines come through, including a Tandy 1000 EX, HX, SX. Uh, have I had a regular Tandy 1000? I don't think I've had a regular one. And I have a TX or TL. Is it a TL? I think it's a TL, it's a 286. Those are Tandy 1000s, and of course, all the TRS-80, uh, Z80 machines, I love those things. The Model 2, the Model 1, the Model 3, the Model 4, the Model 4P, thanks to uh, Seth. And I think I should probably stop talking and just finish up reading the letter. Oh, well, yeah, wait, one more thing. Um, Jim says that his career in IT was sort of based on the fact that he loved computers at a young age. Definitely for me as well. I have had a lifetime career in computers and technology. And, you know, obviously that does stem back to my exposure to them as a kid. So that, that really worked out for me. Anyhow, Jim goes on to say, I've made it my mission to put back together all the aforementioned computers, what he was talking about up here. In so doing, the one thing I have ended up with through eBay purchases are a couple of incorrectly packaged, shattered Apple IIe monochrome monitors. You will find the complete electronics from one inside. It ran perfectly, had no burn-in, but then it stopped. Beforehand, I made a small repair you'll find on the neck board. I'm not sure what's wrong, but in the interim, I had actually managed to get a complete one, so I'm donating the guts for you to repair. <laughs> and yes, uh, the 2E monitor is the one that has the tilt screen. I have one that actually works, but I have an Amdeck monitor, monochrome monitor, it was originally amber, and that CRT was toast. So I have a monitor that's missing its CRT, and I think this might be a good one to go in there. Also enclosed are some eight inch floppies and a floppy changer caddy from an IBM System 36 mainframe. Ooh, interesting. I did many Y2K conversions of RPG programs for this system and it has been very, very good to me through the years. You'll also find an Apple II Smart Port SD project and a Coco DIY ROM cart, potentially for Septandi. Well, sorry about that. This was from August, Jim, <laughs> and I'm only getting to it now in January of 2023. So Septandi is coming on. I look forward to seeing you bring all these little items back to life on the channel. Best regards, Jim. Thank you, Jim. That was a very nice letter. Let's take a look. I think uh, this is packing material. I am really stunned, Jim, on this box. <laughs> Just, it's amazing. Uh, let's see what we got in here. Obviously, as Jim mentioned, when you ship monitors, well, they often can get smashed very easily, unless they're in cases like this. Now, of course, the irony is he sent me a monitor that's already broken in an indestructible box, which is pretty fantastic. All right, so this says Apple II SmartPort SD project. So SmartPort is a type of interface, of course, on the 2C and on the 2E, well, 2E with a special interface card. It's on the 2C, though, built in, and on the 2GS, and it allows for hard drives over the floppy drive port. Now, the Floppy 2, or sorry, the uh, Floppy Emu, that project from Big Mess of Wires, it can emulate the SmartPort hard drive and actually boot right up on an Apple 2C to uh, 32 megabyte hard drive. So this, obviously, is doing the same thing. I can see, looks like an SD card reader right there. And oh, it looks like a little tiny Arduino that plugs into the board here. So open source project. We'll take a look at that in a second. This is probably something I'll have to do on a future video. Uh, put that together and test that out. But that could be a really good way for people to get SD cards like or hard bootable hard drives on their Apple IIc or 2GS without having to buy the floppy Emu. Alrighty, so these look like the floppy disks and a PS1 disk here. Alright, cool. Um, I'm going to set this aside and we're going to keep digging. Alright, next up we got, uh, looks like uh, the DIY cartridge for the Coco, which appears to be 3D printed, the case that is, and it's got a uh, really nice uh, gold contacts there on whatever PCB is in here. So we'll have to give that a try. Alright, looks like this is the monitor main board here. All right, there it is. So this is gonna be for the monochrome monitor. 
Alrighty, so there it is. There's the little power switch that's up on the top with the little LED. This uh, monitor, as you can see here, has a transformer. So this is like the isolated version. And this is part of the power supply here. It's just some capacitors and stuff, filters. Here's the little neck board that plugs into the back of the CRT. The one component on this that's probably impossible to find if it does die is the flyback transformer. If this goes bad, you're pretty much out of luck. Maybe back in the day, this could be something you could buy, but you know, no one's making flybacks anymore. Well, there is, okay, there is a company that's making them, but they're, you know, it's hard to cross-reference and figure out the exact one. And they're making it for popular monitors. Luckily, monochrome monitors are relatively low resolution, or sorry, low voltage. And that means that the flybacks are more reliable. Not, not, they're not perfect and they're not always gonna work forever, but a color monitor has, you know, 24,000 volts, while this probably has 12,000 volts. So there's just less high voltage in there to break down the windings and stuff like that. Anyways, okay, let me move this to the side and let's continue on this adventure. Here's a box that is maybe on the back of the CRT or something. Let's, uh, let's he has written something. Yep. He says, Apple II green CRT. Let's carefully lift this out. <laughs> yeah, this is it. The packing is unbelievably nice. Inside the bottom of the box is just foam. So uh, this is it. This is the CRT. I'm going to extricate it from the plastic. Okay, and there it is. CRT is extricated. I did notice that Jim included uh, some of the schematics here. I think this looks like Sam's. So Sam's must have actually, uh, they must have reverse engineered the monitor. So I'm hoping that the deflection yoke is on here because I noticed it wasn't attached to the PCB. And, oh yes it is, okay, awesome. Oh wow, this just, the packing is amazing. Look how clean the back of this is. Jim must have cleaned this because this is super clean. Samsung, 12 inch, and uh, he wrapped the cables around. Alrighty, there we have it. That is a CRT, let's take a look at the front. Looks good, it's just a little bit of a dirt on there from the packing material. I'm gonna, I'm gonna clean up a little bit. There is just stuff everywhere in here. I need to uh, organize a little bit so I can walk. And then I'm gonna go grab, I think the Amdeck monitor and first we'll test out the CRT. All right, let's start with this Apple II SmartPort SD Nano Shield, code by Robert Justice, Andrea Odevayane, and Catherine Stark. PCB design by Chris Tersteg. I think that's how you pronounce it. So obviously um, this Arduino, would go on here, something like that, maybe the other way around. And then this uh, little SD card thing, adapt to desolder it here, and then that would go on there like that. And then Jim has included the very hard to find Apple, what is this, 19 pin D sub connector. Thing is the footprint on here is for a DB25. So you can't really use this. Um, hmm. Maybe on the project page, it explains how to solder the wires that you need to this. Looks like we have header J2, which maybe those are all the pins that are actually needed for smart port. So you just have to run a ribbon cable from that to the appropriate pins on here. 3D print a shell for this, because you can't buy those anymore either. And then uh, connect that up. Looks like there's a jumper here for power from the Apple. And uh, yeah, the build of materials here is pretty inexpensive, except for this hard to find uh, connector here. I don't have time in this mail call episode to put this together, so I'll put this back in an anti-static bag and it'll be for a future project. Let's open up this cartridge here. This one is for the Coco. Let's get the one screw out of the middle here. Let's take a look at what we see inside. Ah, look, it's just a blank. So I guess you could just make your own mask ROM, Coco EEPROM pack version one. Look at that ENG plating, really, really nice. Coco EEPROM pack by NF6X. That's his uh, call sign there. Looks like we have a jumper for auto start. We've got some address lines up here, probably upper and lower, depending on how you want to map the ROMs in there. There's a GitHub repository, github.com slash NF6X slash Coco EEPROM pack with a K at the end. And I'm assuming these two footprints here, one is gonna be for like a 2764, and one of them will be for a 27256, something like that. And then this 3D printed case here holds this PCB very nicely. So I guess there's nothing to try out here. I thought maybe there'd be a ROM or something in there, but that's okay. This will be for a future, I don't know, ROM experiment. It'd be kind of fun to make a Adrian's dance party right on a cartridge that could just boot right up. It's a disc file right now. I'll have to talk to uh, Paul who made it. 
see if we can make it where I could just auto start a cartridge. That would be very cool. All right, next up we have the discs and the CD here. Let's just cut this open carefully. It's a plastic wrap here. Okay, plastic has been removed. So let's see, we have single-sided, single-density office copy from 1988. And let's see if this looks good. It looks like it's in good shape. Yep, eight-inch discs, very robust, very reliable. Jim called this like a carousel. Oh, look at the discs, they're kind of bent in there. Hmm. So looking at the top side, it says 1A. I assume the discs are supposed to be slotted in here properly and you slide this into something and then it allows it to auto load the discs or something. How exactly do I get the discs out of here? I assume I have to move this spring out of the way and then just slide them out. Okay, there we go. There's one and there is two, a little bit of white out on there. Let's see, next one. Discs are probably totally fine, even though they were kind of warped in there. These discs are so robust, they're very floppy. <laughs> so they'll probably go back into the right shape. Oh, right, this is nice double-sided. I don't hardly have any double-sided media. Most of the eight-inch discs I have are single-sided. I can tell this is a double-sided disc as well. I talked about this, um, I think, in that recent video on my main channel where I go over all the disc formats. That is the single-sided index hole, and that is the double-sided one. They're in a different position. So that is pretty cool. And another double-sided disc. And another one as well, awesome. And that one's a single-sided. Interesting, all this stuff. SSA, AWR, resubmittal, tax year 1988, W2. Bochum's Nursery in Charlotte, North Carolina. I will definitely uh, be bulk erasing these discs. So I don't want to risk anyone's PII getting out there. Single-sided, that one there. Yeah, let's see about this one here. Another double-sided disc, that's awesome. And another one. And that is it, that thing is all empty now. I'm just gonna double up these in the sleeves because there aren't enough sleeves for all the discs. They smell a little bit musty, which is kind of normal, I guess, for these types of discs. And I don't have enough sleeves for these, so I'll just stick them in between there. All right, well, awesome. Thank you, Jim, for that, especially the double-sided ones because other viewers have donated single-sided discs recently, and so I have a good number of those now, but double-sided discs are elusive. And some machines like the NEC, APC, it can use both, but it does definitely uh, support the full-on size of those double-sided, which is like 1.2 megabytes, basically, or something like that. All right, and the last non-monitor thing is this, the PS1 Multimedia Pack Sample Photos Original PS1 Software Backup and the Multimedia Pack. I'm assuming this has been archived somewhere. If not, oh well, I mean, I guess I'll look for it. If this is not archived anywhere, I will absolutely make a disk image of this and stick it up on archive.org. But the fact is the entire backup of the PS1 hard drive is there, which has that boot menu and all that stuff. And I don't even remember if mine has the original menu on there. I don't know. So yeah, like I said, I'll look for this online. If it's not archived, I'll archive it. Alrighty, and the final thing here, of course, is the Apple II monitor. Now, right off the bat, whenever a monitor is damaged in shipping and it's working or intermittently working, always suspect cracks in the PCB. You won't be able to see it on this side, you take this thing out entirely, but looking at the little neck board here, I see the repair that Jim has done. There's a little blob of solder right there but I can see that the crack actually extends all the way over to here. So those traces are broken as well. And in fact, uh, yeah, it starts there, goes to that pin there, and it makes its way across that track and that track. So both of those are broken as well, meaning the repair that you did there, Jim, was intermittent with these two pins. Now, uh, I think you said here on this, high voltage uh, not working. Well, cracks on the neck board here will have no effect on the high voltage. So if that is the case, then there are probably cracks on this PCB as well, which are causing that issue. So I'm just gonna take a look at this board here. This is like this, whatever, inductor and filters and the fuse for the main power supply. This almost certainly converts down to like 14 volts or something like that. And then uh, there's a simple regulation circuit right here, which will, uh, looks like it's a 78S15. So I suppose B plus 
might be 15 volts, which is probably written on here somewhere. Let's see here. The schematics are relatively low res, and that's probably because, oh yeah, there it is, source uh, 12 volts, and that's through a dropper resistor, and then 14 volts right there, right off the regulator. Um, without a doubt, this will need to be repaired, and I can see a bend in this whole PCB, so whatever impact this monitor had was pretty severe, obviously. All right, I'm just taking the PCB off here, so removing the screw so that little shield comes off. I think the board is free. Yes, it is, so we'll just slide this out. Now, there are a bunch of wires that are soldered on, so I can't get it completely disconnected, but I can unplug the transformer at least. Okay, PCB's out, so when inspecting for cracks, make sure you always look where the screws are. And I'm not seeing anything here. No, that looks okay. Check around the flyback, because it's very heavy. Looks like, looks like that's okay. I don't see any cracks at all. Also cracked solder joints could be an issue as well. That can definitely throw things for a loop. And he said there was no high voltage. Well, you're not gonna have a high voltage if you have a non-functional um, horizontal output transistor, which is this one right here. And those solder joints look fine. And it has a screw holding that heat sink down so that keeps the PCB in good shape, but definitely I'm gonna do a very careful inspection for any cracks in the board. They could be anywhere. Well, everything actually seems totally fine on the bottom side of that. So I'm just gonna put this back in uh, with enough screws just to kind of hold it in place uh, on this metal chassis here, since this is good for testing purposes. All right, I'm gonna to try to clean off the uh, little solder bridge he put on here because I would like to inspect what is under here. Oh yeah, okay, bad. It's a trace that's entirely kind of folded over actually. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, I'm gonna dremel away the, the solder mask with this kind of rubber tip here to make it easier to solder over. This tip is completely worn out, unfortunately, but it still works good enough for this purpose, I think. Okay, yeah, that's good. To really strengthen this, you'd want to actually lay down some wires over that and solder that onto what I just cleaned off. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to double check that this is good. So there to there, there to there, and there to there. Yeah, those are all connected now. Excellent. All right, next up is the CRT. I'm just going to put this down here and take a look at the connectors here. Everything look okay. Yep, looks all right. Doesn't seem too dirty. Are these connected all right? Yes, I think they are. Of course, if these aren't making good contact on the PCB, you are not going to have uh, high voltage either. So I'm gonna use this little plastic piece, uh, whatever tub here to tilt that up like so. I just have to kind of move things around here because the cables aren't really long enough to do what I'm trying to do here just so everything is clear. So the neck board is connected here, high voltage is connected. I need to connect this ground lead here to uh, the edge or one of the ears here on the CRT. This is uh, one of the deflection yokes and he wrote uh, gray brown. So that one is there and the green white one is there. And I think that is good. I'm just gonna move this to be a little less janky. And um, let's connect this up. Let me grab some clip leads. All right, that is connected. Um, I think we're ready for testing. So this is the power switch right here. There's the contrast knob. Just make sure that is off, and it is. I just plugged it in, now it's off still, but of course now there's a high voltage, not just the high voltage for the CRT, there is the high voltage for the power supply as well. In fact, this switch right here is almost certainly just mains voltage, so I have to be very careful turning this on. So I'm just gonna do this. Okay, the power light's on. It sounds like there's high voltage. Uh, I need to plug in the test pattern generator. Oh, which I happen to have one right here on the floor. We'll use this one. All righty, test pattern generator. Uh, the RCA connection, I'm gonna turn the power off here. It is a little hard to access. <laughs> it's under the CRT here. Let's lift this up here. Okay, there we go. 
Make sure everything is still connected. It is. Ground is good on the CRT. Here we go. Try again. Power lights on. And I think on the power, let's see, the power LED. Oh, well, look, there we go. We have an image. <laughs> I don't need to do too much else troubleshooting wise. Uh, it's upside down. The CRT is upside down, but let's prime the convergence. There it is, the convergence. Let's turn this up. This is the contrast. Oh, the knob is very, very scratchy. For, we need some uh, deoxid in there. Let's do it. Let's do it. We're going to use the uh, QD electric cleaner. To cut the power first. The pot is very gummy. Like it's not turning very smoothly. So you can kind of tell when it's working in the QD electric cleaner when it starts to turn more smoothly. I'm just going to unplug everything here. Don't want this uh, power switch here with potential mains. It's going to hit a lot of that in there. Because, okay, it is freed up. I mean, it was turning smoothly all right, already, but now it's, now it's much better. All right, let's plug everything back in. Let's try that again. So there's two plugs, one for the test pattern generator. There we go. Power switch enabled. There we go. All right, there we go. That's it. And look, it now turns nice and smooth. No more scratchiness. Got to say it's not very bright, though. That is one thing that is for sure. The controls for the brightness are a little hard to access because I have to reach down <laughs> through high voltage area. So let me turn this off first. Looks like it's this control right here. So we'll just turn this back on. I can turn that with these needle nose without any danger. Okay. Now let's turn this. This pot's also a little uh, dirty. Okay, so there we can see that the raster is visible, like the, uh, you know, the, the black is now turning green. So yeah, it's uh, not the brightest CRT in the world, that's for sure. Uh, contrast is at maximum right there. Let's bring up something else. Actually, you know what? That's, that is pretty bright. That's pretty bright. Turn this down so... This part here is not green anymore. So that's about as bright as it gets this particular CRT. And when we turn it off and on, yep. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? It gives you a single line. So it takes a second for the vertical to start. <laughs> that's just the way these monitors are, I guess. Now, as for the fault that the chassis had that was preventing it from working for Jim, I am 99.9, .9, whole lot of nine sure, it was those crack solder joints on the neck board there. He fixed one of them, but he missed the other two. And that is probably, you know, maybe one of those was the cathode or the heater or whatever. High voltage would have been working no matter what goes on with those connections. But yeah, that would definitely pre prevent you from having a picture. And it probably would have been intermittent, like it would have been working and then going in and out because, you know, they were touching those, those traces, but just not all the way. All right, now I know this works. I need to take the deflection yoke off of this monitor because I'm going to leave it with this Apple II monitor. So I've gone ahead and loosened the clamp here. Uh, maybe loosened it a little more. <laughs> now that it's loose, I'm just gonna leave this connected. Of course, this is all unplugged from the wall and everything. And now we just need to break this free. Just have to kind of grip, grip it with your hand and twist it. And then it should come off. There we go. Now that came off. Alrighty, this is the Amdeck 310A, which is going to be getting this green CRT. This was originally amber because of the A. And uh, yeah, so it's going to look a little unusual. Uh, the monitor's in good shape, other than the fact that it's quite yellowed on the top. That side's a bit better. But the front, which is painted, looks really good. Inside the CRT, I have, uh, there's the deflection yoke. And uh, everything else is ready to go. The screws even for the CRT are in there. And the only thing that might be a problem here is the mounting tab. But I'm just looking inside here and it looks like the mounting tab needs to be on the backwards position on the implosion band here. And it is. So I'm going to say this is going to work. So let me open this uh, thing up and I'll mount that CRT inside. Ah, I have a note in here. It says, no picture, sounds off. I fixed this in uh, May, I guess, 2022. It looks like it has a shorted, di it looks like diode 101 was shorted. I must have made a repair video about this. 
Alrighty, I'm ready to mount this. Before I do, I just wanna make sure the front glass is clean because I won't have an opportunity to clean it at least under the bezel once it's uh, mounted in the case. Alrighty, so the question is, is this going to fit in here? I'm not 100% sure. I think it's gonna work, everyone. Okay, it is screwed into the case. Uh, deflection yoke wrapped up in bubble wrap for protection. I don't remember which way is up. We'll have to figure that out once we uh, get this thing powered up. We've got to connect up these connectors and then we just connect up this little connector here. This doesn't have a neck board. It instead has just the connector with a little uh, spark gap on it. And we gotta plug in the high voltage, which is gonna go just like that. I'll kind of turn that up so the, the wire just sort of stays up. The board just uh, is held in by the back case. Uh, what else is going on? So the ground is connected right here to this corner. The screws are in. I guess that's it. We just have to figure out which way the deflection yield goes and then tighten the clamp down. I'm gonna put it with the uh, wires up here because there's some writing there and it's facing the right direction. If it's wrong, we can fix that very quickly. Let's see how it looks on the front side. All right, would you look at that? That would be a green Amdeck monitor. The CRT is good. It's lined up around the bezel on all the sides. Let's make sure this is off. It is. Let's plug this in. It's in there. Let's power this on. I think everything is gonna be okay. Don't hear anything, but oh, we see an image. Oh, <laughs> we have it turned 90 degrees there. All right, there we go. We have raster, it's a little dark at the top. That's odd, I wonder, wonder what's going on there. Let's get the test signal generator up here so we can input a signal into this thing. All right, there we go. It's very bright. All right, so there it is, test pattern. Now, it looks like it's shifted over to one side. Now, we have controls on the back here. Okay, this is horizontal hold, so that, that alters the horizontal oscillator, which also does move the picture back and forth a little bit. This one, what is this, vertical hold. Now, I can tell that the picture is quite shrunk in. I mean, um, on like an Apple II, there's gonna be a big border. Now I can move these centering rings here on the deflection yoke to, uh, to move the picture up and down and left and right and stuff. Uh, other controls visible on the back are V linearity, V size. So this is V size right here. So we can bring the picture in or out. There should be some amount of overscan. All right, and I see the width coil right there. So let me grab a plastic tool to adjust that. Now it is a coil, so you never want to stick metal tools inside a coil. You have to stick plastic tools, so that's what these are for. I have to find the right size. Not this one. So if I bring up this and I turn the coil, it's widening the picture. Basically when you're working with one of these older CRTs, you have to work within the, the, the range of all the controls and the centering rings on the deflection yoke are physical movements of the entire image around. But sometimes if you move it too far to one side, well, then the electronics doesn't actually scan the beam far enough. So you have to kind of fiddle with all the controls to get it where you think it works. I think I'll need to hook an Apple II up to this thing to really see um, you know, if it's mostly centered and if I can use the horizontal hold control on the back to center the image for the Apple II. Obviously, uh, this particular image if I bring this one up, um, this, this gives you a little bit better idea of centered. Like look at how much of this bar is there. Notice you see uh, some of that there missing. And if we go the other way, same thing can happen there. So there's actually a good amount of range in here where I think we should be good. We should be able to get us an image that's centered with an Apple II hooked up to it. Alrighty, Apple II is here. Let's uh, move this video cable off of the test pattern generator onto the 2C's video output port. Looks like the picture has moved quite a bit over to one side. Let's go to the diagnostics because that allows us to kind of see what we're talking about there. 
All right, well, uh, I think maybe I should just widen the image. That is gonna be one solution to this problem. All right, that's about actually as wide as it can go. The, the width coil, it's a adjustable coil. It only has so much in and out you can turn it. And that is as much as it can go. So that's what the Apple IIc looks like on here. But you know what? That's good enough. It looks relatively centered. It's maybe a little bit too high. So let's see if we can fix that. All right, well, I fiddled with it enough and I think that is gonna be as good as it gets. Now let's see how this looks. If I go PR number three and uh, we do call minus 151, there it is. And you know what? Text is very readable. It's very sharp. It's really nice. If we go GR and back to text mode, that's gonna make, uh, there it is, lots of text. And you know what? It's very bright. It's very readable. I think the contrast is basically all the way up on here, but you know, that's just how it goes. Uh, if we move this over anymore, it starts to roll, but you know what? Ah, it's good enough. It looks pretty good. The text is nice and sharp. Now, incidentally, by the way, the Apple II, the image is just shifted over compared to other computers. If I put the Commodore 64 on here now, it's gonna be more over here and I have to move the image back. So it's okay that it's all the way at like one far extreme for the Apple II. But obviously, monochrome monitor like this, most likely gonna be using it on an Apple II. It's one of the most common computers that has a high resolution like 80 column composite output where you would wanna use a green screen or you know a monochrome screen versus a color screen. And yeah, it's, um, it's looking good. If back in the day I was using an Apple II and I had this uh, 12 inch Amdeck monitor, I think I'd be pretty happy. Now is green better than amber? That's one of the questions. Of course you have green, amber, and white as your possible choices. And there's even two different versions of white. There's that blue white, like the Macintoshes, and then there's the paper white, which is a more yellowish white color. And you know, there's debates as to which is better. I don't know which I prefer more. I think I like amber more, but honestly, every time I find an amber monitor, they're worn out. Those CRTs, those amber CRTs, they just do not last. I think part of it is that green is a color that your eyes are very sensitive to, along with blue. So green and blue are very vibrant, but amber is on the side of the spectrum on which your eyes are less sensitive to. So you have to turn up the brightness more, which wears out the CRT faster. Although, you know, I don't know if that's the real reason why the amber ones are always dimmer. Maybe it's because the chemicals that make up the amber phosphor wear out faster than the others. That could be it too, but I don't know what the reason is. We got an amber LED here and that looks fine. Well, so there we have it. That's gonna be it for this mail call episode. Thanks, Jim, for sending in this uh, green CRT, which would bring my Amdeck monitor back to life. And also this uh, cool Coco cartridge. If someone knows how to get the 8-bit dance party for the Coco working on a cartridge like this where I could just stick it in and have it work automatically, definitely please let me know. And as I said, uh, if this isn't available online, I will archive this PS2 uh, CD and put that up on archive.org. And there'll be a future video at some point about this, uh, what is this thing called again? The Smart SD, which allows you to boot hard drive images right on your Apple IIc. Like on this machine, it'd be perfect for that inexpensive way to do that so you don't have to buy the floppy emu which is good product but it's very expensive and then thanks for these discs especially the double-sided ones that is awesome i need to uh get my eight inch disc drive out because i have some other discs i need to archive and uh, then i'm going to format all of these and make sure they're good but eight inch discs are incredibly robust and reliable so there's a very very good chance all of these work look at this eight inch disc it's like as big as the entire apple ic <laughs> Anyhow, thanks very much for the donation, Jim. Thanks for watching, everyone. Thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. Patrons get early access to videos. You know, all the usual stuff. I've said it a million times. Um, subscribe if you haven't already. It helps me a lot on the second channel. And thumbs up if you do like this. Thumbs down if you didn't. You know, all the usual stuff. And that is going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe. And I will see you next time. Bye.